So uh, I'm here to talk about a new architecture we've been working on at Uber, uh, basically to address some of the issues we've seen with the Lambda and the Kappa architectures in production. And uh, uh, let me just define the problem that we're tackling here. So the basic problem is whenever you have a real-time job, you often need an offline counterpart to that. Uh, there are many use cases for this. Uh, the typical use case is uh, a backfill, which we have very commonly at Uber, which is essentially, you know, you have some data that has been processed with the real-time pipeline, and you later on realize that you need to reprocess it for some reason. Either you change the uh, logic or some there were bugs or what have you. There are other issues like, you know, off, uh, reasons why you want to do something like that. Maybe you want to do offline uh, experimentation and testing uh, before you switch online, right? A couple of other use cases there. Uh, the typical um, approach that's usually taken uh, for these is usually either the Lambda architecture or the Kappa architecture. And uh, we'll briefly talk about what these are and uh, uh, what are the issues we've seen with these. So the Lambda architecture is basically that for your real-time job, you would have like a streaming job. And for your offline processing, you'll have a bad job. So you basically have two jobs. And uh, often, the problem is that you have to maintain two code bases, right? Uh, basically, uh, sometimes these two APIs may not even have similar constructs. So uh, maintenance gets more complicated then. The other, uh, I guess, uh, Variation to this uh, architecture is to use a unified API, basically something like SQL or Beam, uh, so that uh, it unifies the semantics across both modes and you basically, um, but you're essentially still running the offline job in batch mode, right? So uh, what we found is actually that even in the batch mode, there are some limitations we run into. And that's basically, uh, the main one is actually resource consumption usage. Uh, so let's say you want to process one, let's say a week worth of uh, you know, historic data and you need let's say 200 containers. Now if you want to process six months of data, your resource usage balloons, right? You can just do it with the same number of resources. And uh, then the way to solve that is try to break it up to smaller jobs and basically, you know, coordinate them one after another, right? So then you have to do the coordination and break up. And then you get into a little bit of tricky situations like windowing, where if your bad job, uh, let's say your window spans, the first, uh, I should say, if your window spans the batch boundaries, then you need to figure out how to deal with them. So coming to the Kappa architecture, the basic idea here is instead of switching between uh, like batch and streaming, you just uh, retain your data longer in Kafka and then you take your streaming job and just point it uh, back in time, right? And then just replay. Uh, the real problem here is that Kafka doesn't really uh, support long retention uh, because uh, of the nature of the limits on the broker's uh, storage and partition size, I'm sorry, a topic size. So um, it's only a few days you can really do that. Uh, but the other problem is also the expense because Kafka is not really a data warehouse, it's more expensive compared to HDFS. So uh, the workaround, usually that's discussed is tiered storage, like Apache Pulsar. So your uh, near-term data is on local store, and older data goes into some kind of a uh, transparent remote store like S3, so that your you know your real-time job can then rewind further back. So this, uh, but this creates a different problem. You end up with data duplication because your query jobs will still need another copy of the data in Hive, which can actually be queried, right? Whereas uh, the job in your tiered storage on the remote store is only accessed by some of your backfill jobs once in a while. So lower data utilization and duplication, those are the two issues there when you go with the tiered storage model. 
And then the way to work around that and say, okay, uh, without tiered storage, you can do it with mini batches, right? Basically, you break it up. You take some data from Hive, few days worth of data, copy it into Kafka, process it with a real-time job, and then just do this over and over again. Unfortunately, this is actually quite expensive because when you copy the data from Hive or HDFS to Kafka, you have to actually restore the order, right? So actually this sorting and then copying can be actually more expensive than your original job. And that's something we have seen in, uh, quite often at uh, Uber. And then the third problem is that uh, when you have two sources, you, let's say you're trying to join two sources, right, two topics. Uh, one of them could be a low volume topic, which typically is the case. The other one is a high volume topic. So the low volume topic goes really fast and that messes up the windowing, uh, leading to drop data or out of memory. So what is it that we're looking for? This is what we're really looking for, which is uh, we want to reuse code between the offline and online processing. The windowing should work well in either mode. No splitting jobs. And hardware requirements should not balloon because you sometimes want to process a few days worth of data. Sometimes you may just want to go back a long time. And you don't have to ideally rewrite to new APIs and it should be efficient. Uh, a simple way to put it is that ideally we want to have it all, right? Okay, so Kappa Plus. So this is our attempt to tackle this problem. So this is actually the key slide which enables this architecture, and that's a change in perspective. So first we want to decouple the ideas of bounded versus unbounded data, which is the nature of the data. Batch versus streaming, which is the nature of the compute. Offline versus real time, which is how you use it. So instead of thinking that we want to enable any job to run either in batch mode or streaming mode, we switch it around and say, let's just think about which jobs really we need to support. And those jobs are only which actually have a real time footprint, right? So that instantly eliminates a large class of jobs. You don't have jobs which actually sort the entire uh, input data in, in real time, right? This doesn't occur. Joins are always uh, within a window, right, in the real time world. So um, that simply reduces the problem domain and uh, basically uh, also the solution is simpler. So that tells us as, I mean, that basically requires us to now identify the kinds of jobs that need to run in these two modes. And uh, we have a job classification system for that. And uh, the key issue is to deal with ordering problems in this mode. Okay, so coming to the architecture. So the core idea here is a little bit counterintuitive. Uh, we are employing streaming compute for offline data processing directly from the warehouse. So we are not tied to Kafka, um, uh, but we are able to reuse streaming compute for both online and offline. So there's two architectural components here. One is a job classification system and the other one is a processing model. Uh, the job classification system is basically telling you what kinds of jobs you can actually have in real time and which you need to support. And then the processing model is how to process it using streaming compute directly from the warehouse. The uh, one thing is about, you need small tweaks depending on the category you're working on, the type of job, when you employ this processing model. And that's where also the classification system helps. Uh, the one assumption is that when you're actually dealing with historic data, right? Uh, if there's real-time data that's been now in the warehouse, uh, the one assumption we're making is it's partitioned by time, either hourly, daily, or monthly, or whatever. And that's typically a case that we've seen and also used at Uber. So there's four categories of jobs. Uh, the first one is stateless. The remaining ones are stateful. 
Stateless jobs usually there's no windowing, there's no state, right? Uh, and memory footprint is not a concern. Uh, data order is also typically not a concern in these jobs. Uh, so these are actually the simplest problems and usually not a concern. So the meat of the problem comes to category two, three, and four, which is the stateful jobs. So the category two is basically when you have windowing with aggregation. What that means is as the data is coming in records, you are calculating the incremental aggregate value and storing just that in your window, right? You're not holding on to all the records. When you do that, you realize that your memory footprint is maybe decent, but not significantly huge. So you're doing things like some average count and all those things, right? But here are still, the order of data is important, but the key insight here is it can be solved without strict ordering. And we'll look into how that's done. The category three is windowing with retention, which means instead of doing this incremental aggregates, you are retaining all the data in memory in the window. So you need to, uh, let's say typical use cases of these are joins, or you're trying to hold on to all the records so that when the window closes, you want to do some, maybe a pattern assessment or something of that sort. Uh, here it's obviously evident that the memory requirements are much higher, right? Compared to category two. And finally, category four, which you're trying to basically hold everything onto in the windows, in the memory. These actually never occur in real time. Uh, basically thing like sorting entire input data set or joins without windowing and so forth. So category four is really not something we need to bother about and not support it either. Uh, so essentially the meat of the problem now is category two and three. So this is the processing model. So this actually says how to use streaming compute to address uh, the problem. Uh, it first specifies a partially ordered read scheme. Um, what it says is how to read the data. So the base first idea is strict ordering across partitions. So you only read one partition at a time and the oldest partition first. And then within the partition, you're free to read the data in any order. So in that sense, it's partially ordered. Both of these actually give significant benefits because once you say, I'm going to only process one at a time and then move to the next, that means your resources are bounded with what you need to process one partition, right? It's a huge, huge gain. Uh, so essentially, you can process any number of partitions with one job with finite resources. And this also helps windowing correctness because of the order in which you read the partitions. Within the partition, you can read concurrently. So for example, if you're reading from a high partition, your high partition may have a few hundred files there. You can read them all in parallel, okay? This opens up concurrency and very high throughputs. This doesn't mean you cannot exploit order. There are some very advanced use cases where you may actually need to exploit some order within the partition. Second part is actually to emit the watermarks when you're switching partitions. Uh, what, what this means is you're keeping the windows open for the entire processing of the partition. So out of ordering is okay. Out of order reads is okay. You load all of the data into the windows, and once you're ready to switch partitions, you close them, do the compute, uh, or you already have the pre-computed uh, aggregates, and you basically close the windows. So the idea is to emit the watermarks uh, between partitions. And finally, lockstep progression. This happens when you need have two or more sources. So if you're doing a join or a union, right, between two, let's say two hive tables, or two uh, Kafka topics. The idea is that the first, both, the, uh, both of the sources need to switch to the next partition, basically lockstep. So one guy needs to wait for the other to finish before they both move to the next partition. So what do we do uh, for each of these categories? For stateless, uh, is nothing special. You just change the data source 
uh, on the job and set the parallelism to the desired throughput, and you're done, right? Category two, that's basically the low to medium memory footprint. Uh, it's very simple, you just put the memory state back in. Now the key thing comes in actually the window parallelism. You need to estimate what is the amount of memory footprint on the windowing state for processing one partition. And basically um, you allocate that many, that, that many containers or set the parallelism accordingly on that uh, window operator. All the other operators in your job it's all basically throughput based parallelism. Category three has a couple of variations of how you can handle this. The one is just to switch from memory state to RocksDB. The other one you can do is a trick that essentially you reduce the partition size. So if you have very large daily partitions, you, you, you talk to your warehouse guys and say, you know, we prefer to have a six hour partition or something of that sort. So suddenly the size of the partition is reduced and therefore your footprint and memory is also reduced. So that's another, and then you can just use the memory state backend, right? And the other third one is a little bit more advanced. It's a rare case, but you could look into actually exploiting some order within the partition. So what are the basic benefits that we have or the, you know, the more mainstream approach of trying to use batch in the offline mode. The basic idea is, of course, you can take a single job and, you know, you can process one day or, you know, several years worth of data with that and with finite resources. Uh, makes it very easy to estimate and actually allocate these jobs because we have seen some jobs don't even come up because the number of containers it needs is too large. Your cluster just doesn't have the capacity and they might even block your you know, cluster for other jobs to use them. Uh, the other thing is obviously no splitting of jobs. A windowing works, even you don't have to batch it into smaller pieces, so windows are okay. And the results are visible right away. You don't have to wait for the whole job to finish before you know, the any results are visible. After each partition, you actually see the data. Uh, so the last point I make here is an important one. These are not two independent approaches in a sense that you could apply this processing model even to the unified API world or to an existing API, which is what we're doing currently in Kappa Plus. We are actually applying it within Flink, existing APIs. Because Kappa Plus is not a new API, it's just a processing model, right? It specifies how to process with stream compute. So, Let's talk about implementation now. Um, so the architecture is itself uh, basically agnostic of the streaming engine. It's not really tied to any specific engine. Um, but the things you need to implement for each engine depending on what engine you're working on. So what are those things you need to do? So no new APIs. So the basic change you need to do is those sources that you use in these engines, they need to pro, uh, support this processing model, which is basically uh, one partition at a time, older partitions first, and concurrent reads within the partition, and uh, lockstep progression, right? Uh, if you're trying to apply this on top of Kafka source, then you just need to do the lockstep progression so that you know uh, after a certain point in time, the Kafka source stops for the other source and then moves to the next set of data. Um, and then watermarking I talked about, right? The basic idea is uh, when you're done processing a certain amount of data, which is one partition, you basically emit the, uh, uh, you emit the uh, watermarks and flush the windows. So at a high level, that's what you want to do for adopting it on any API or streaming engine way. Now, this is how a job actually looks like. Uh, this is a job which supports both offline and uh, real-time uh, uh, processing. The, you know, the first two lines, you can see there's a simple flag uh, which says, is it in offline mode or not? In which case, it selects the right source and then the right watermarking. And pretty much it, right? The rest of the job doesn't change. So you get the same code in both modes. Uh, the one thing, of course, what happens in offline jobs is the 
uh, volume of data is very large, so because it's already there. Uh, so you may need to adjust your parallelisms there to actually accommodate for that kind of uh, throughput. Or you may want to actually constrain the throughput because, uh, you, uh, you know, um, at some point, well, it usually needs more parallelism than the real-time job, but if you use too much, then it might, uh, you know, your downstream, uh, if it's in production-facing uh, store, then it might get overwhelmed. So what do we do for Flink specifically? So at Uber, we have an implementation of a Hive slash HDFS data source, which supports this problem model. So this is a job graph. So the three boxes, the three red boxes, they are the hive source. Uh, the orange yellow one is actually the, the rest of the job. So you can see that actually the hive source is not one operator, it's actually three components. Uh, the first one on the top is file selector, which actually is going to select the files to be processed. Uh, now here the key thing that we're trying to support is actually one partition at a time processing. So the source needs to know that uh, the current, uh, you know, all the files in the current partition have been processed, so you're okay to move to the next partition. So we need a kind of a feedback mechanism there, which is a little tricky to do in Flink. So we need an out-of-band communication mechanism. And also we need a way to concurrent, you know, in a, you need a way to basically say, these are all the files to be read in parallel and all of them should not kind of have a race in the sense that they should pick different files to read and not process the same file over and over again. So the file selector is basically, uh, so, uh, okay, so here I have these numbers, one, n, and one, right in blue. Uh, that's basically the parallelisms uh, for those operators. So the file selector is always fixed to one. Right, it's never more than one. Uh, same way the last operator, which is the zookeeper up update, I'll talk about that. That's also fixed to one. The user can change the parallelism on the file reader. So that's your concurrency, how, how concurrently you want to read. So the file selector basically comes up, it picks the partition. Oh, and there's actually a zookeeper-based uh, feedback system over here. Um, so the first, so the file selector's job is to pick the partition, emit the names of the files in that partition to the downstream operator. It creates a bunch of Z nodes for each file that is, is being processed, and uh, also one for the partition being processed. The file reader, was, you have a whole bunch of them, any number, uh, let's say 20. So each of them will get a different file to process. Uh, they will deserialize it, and once they're done, they inform the zookeeper updater operator that they're done with that file. So that uh, gives an indication to zookeeper updater to go and delete the zookeeper nodes corresponding to that file. Uh, and once all the files in that partition are processed, the partition uh, Z node is deleted. So, um, so the reason for the zookeeper updater to be separated out is so that the file, I mean, this could have been done by the file readers directly, but the idea is there's gonna be a lot of zookeeper uh, file readers, so you want to just have a single connection back to zookeeper. So therefore, we moved the zookeeper interaction out so that there's only one guy, one thread actually talking to zookeeper for the deletion. Um, now the zookeeper, uh, actually when the zookeeper updater deletes the node spe uh, specific to the partition, uh, this actually triggers a watch which was set up by the file selector and it basically will notify the file selector that the partition is complete and then actually the, uh, the rest of the job can progress to the next partition. So the file selector realizes that the current partition is finished and then it, it moves, moves on. So the second problem uh, that's tricky to solve was this multi-source lockstep progression. The basic idea is that, um, uh, you know, if you have multiple sources in the job, they need to progress in a lockstep fashion from one partition to the next. So the basic idea here is we use a cyclic barrier 
uh, implemented on top of, top of Zookeeper. So we have uh, this job here which has two hive source operators, one on the top, the top three boxes is the first one and the bottom three boxes are the other one. So the file selector, each of the file selectors, what they do is they enter a barrier and wait for the other sources to be ready. Once everyone's in the barrier, then uh, the processing begins. And then this kind of the cycle basically uh, repeats. So the solution overall is fairly simple. Uh, you just need a cyclic barrier. Uh, so um, this basically allows the sources to coordinate among each other. Now the tricky thing here is uh, when you have barriers, you need to know how many other participants are in the barrier. So if you're having two sources versus 10 sources, uh, basically the participants need to know how many other participants are there. So we have implemented something there so that when the job is defined, uh, the count of the sources is exposed uh, so that you have the right, uh, you know how long to wait in, in the barrier. So uh, that sort of, uh, how, how am I doing on time? Okay, around 27 minutes. Okay, so that still leaves us with some time. There are, I have a slide here which talks about some of the details uh, where you, will, you, you may have to encounter. Um, but I think I'll leave that because that can be a little bit of longer discussion. Uh, maybe I'll just uh, open up for questions now. Yeah. Oh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, I think that's a really cool, cool approach. Um, who has a question? So each partition processing is independent to other partitions. So like if you have any data across the partitions, uh, which are basically requires like, let's say key by operators or something like that, then so basically the, the source has to be partition already based on the keys or something, right? So uh, normally uh, you have to think of a use case actually to be very clear about your question. So typically, uh, le le are you talking, you're probably talking about, let's say you're talking about a stateful job, right? So stateful job, then you're talking about windowing somewhere there. And then you're doing some kind of a key by, let's say uh, you are looking for all, uh, the total number, let's say you're do dealing with a category two job, which is aggregation. So. Let's say you're trying to compute the total number of rides per city, right? That's a very simple aggregation. So essentially, that happened over the last one hour because it's a real-time job. It's always within the context of a window, right? So now your partition is already based on time, correct? So essentially, all of your data is already in that partition. You don't need to look at another partition, right? So does that clarify? It? If basically you mentioned like if the partition itself covering all the uh, joints that you need for that particular key by for that window, right? Correct. Then it's fine. But if it is crossing it, which which was not actually solved by the previous batch job as well, because the the window is crossing, then we cannot solve the way the it can be solved with the real. Yeah. Time. So it can cross the boundaries in this model. The normally what happens is you're always looking at a time boundary. Mm -hmm. So when you cross the, uh, the cross the partition boundary, uh, basically you need to only close the windows that have the that fall before the end of that partition, not some of the ones that overlap it. They'll get closed at the next partition. Next partition. Okay. So then, because window is getting applied based on the flink uh, uh, watermarks. watermarks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Thanks. Yeah. So that's actually the really fundamental point you're point bringing out, because how does the windowing work, and you know. So we've eliminated all these problems that you never really have to bother cross partition just by constraining this idea that uh, uh, real time jobs have a very specific limited characteristics and those are the one, only ones you need to bother about. Hi. Uh, one of the challenges also um, is bootstrapping state. So when you try to you know, start your real time application, you want to warm up the state from historical data. Uh, did, you, did you integrate this approach with a job that has both uh, batch to warm up and, and moving to real time? And did it involve 
canceling the job and restart it, or did you dynamically kind of change the source? Yeah, so I mean, yeah, there's, so you're basically talking about, I think the last use case that I've mentioned on the slide, which is bootstrapping state, and there's others as well. So right now, most of the use case we're working on is mostly backfill, and then we're taking on the offline stuff. But the idea is very similar, that essentially you run your offline job, create a state, but you're doing it in streaming mode, right? You create the state, take the save point, and then you start the online job. That, that's one way of doing. Uh, uh, the other option is actually to do some kind of a dynamic switching at runtime, where after you come to a certain point, if it's possible, to the, the, the source switches from um, the Hive store to another store, or to from the Hive, reading from Hive, it will switch over to Kafka, and then also switch the watermarking scheme. So you might need another layer of not only list the files in a partition, but list all the partitions right. uh, until you basically finish them. Correct. But I don't recommend this hybrid uh, source because when you run the job in offline mode, the parallelism is very different than when you run it in uh, online mode. So you might actually want to just use an offline source with different, uh, different parallelisms. Uh, they just do their stuff and then you just bring up an online job with uh, a, a, a save point that's used for that. Thanks. Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, can you go through the uh, the explanation again of why you broke out the uh, Zookeeper updater? Oh, uh, okay. I, I haven't missed that. Yeah, it's a tricky one because actually this is a one and a half hour worth of content I've tried to condense here. Uh, so sometimes uh, it's hard to. Uh, so what's happening here is actually, um, so you're asking why the Zookeeper updater was split out. Uh, basically, uh, if, now, if the alternative is to have the Zookeeper updates happen directly in the file readers. Uh, and essentially, at that point, you have just too many connections open to Zookeeper. So the idea is that you don't need that many connections open to Zookeeper. The more jobs, the more of these. And in offline mode, you probably have large parallelisms. So the idea is an optimization that you can just uh, move it to a single guy and just uh, handle it. Now, this Zookeeper updater, for example, for this specific problem, uh, it will change depending on engine to engine. Like in Flink, we don't have a acknowledgement model that goes back uh, to the upstream guy. So we need to use an out of band mechanism. Any other questions? All right, then yeah. Thanks okay. a lot for this talk. <laughs> <laughs>